Hi, Edwin. Thanks for joining me. So um, Edwin Garland, musician, producer, and most importantly today, punter at um, various venues around Sydney. And today um, I'm chatting to Edwin about the um, Strawberry Hills Hotel and the Evening Star Hotel. So thanks, Edwin. Thanks for joining me. That's cool. And what you're doing has been amazing. I've seen the growth of what you're doing. It's also your videos are getting really exciting, but you think it's very culturally important for us. Thank you, know? you. That's really nice. So, Edwin, I think one of my first questions was um, uh, mostly about what are some exciting, you know, highlights, memories for you at uh, at the Strawberry Hills Hotel um, and, of course, the Evening Star. So whatever you wanted to talk about first. Well, Strawberry Hill, I, 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 I think what made Strawberry Hill exciting was the location and what was happening in Sydney at that time. Yeah. And I think it was it was the post radio Birdman thing. Mm -hmm. And Birdman had opened a floodgate for independent labels. A lot of people yep. involved Birdman started labels. A lot of bands started and from about seventy eight, seventy nine, and even like Midnight All and the Angels were influenced by Birdman. But yeah. it opened a floodgate. And we had our street press, we had Ram and Jerk, and everything was looking at Sydney. Yeah. This is what what would happen is that musicians from Perth, which would be Kim Salmon and the Triffitts and Dave Faulkner, yeah. they saw Sydney was happening. They yeah. all moved in. There'd be households of those sort of people. There'd be the Guru's household, the Triffitts household. I can name people from um, Brisbane, which is Ronnie Pino and Scrimmy yeah. Clark and Brad Shepard. They all came down. Yeah. You had the trade union club, but you had all these cool little venues around Surrey Hills. You had, it, but some of them had were rich tribal, like the Sussex Hotel was very mod. Yeah, some very open venues, and I think the Strawberry Hill was very special because people would go to Strawberry Hill first or the Southern Cross early on, then they'd go up to the trade later, and the trade would go to two thirty in the morning. It was the main place you'd go to, and it'd be amazing because it was free. There was a lot of amazing residencies. Oh, like, okay, yep. Yeah. Like I remember the Triffitts, and I read something about the Triffitts, and I just loved them. I mean, they were my age. Yeah. Maybe a year younger, but they were, you know, David McCoon was 19, 20, doing, this, doing these amazing songs, very influenced by Dylan and the Velvets. And I saw X, and they just threw me to the wall. They were so loud, so confrontational, and Lucas and Roland, and, and that was the early over Steve. The gig I went to with X was actually the one that Kathy Green went to on a date with Mark Seymour. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she says when she saw X, it gave, she had tribulation. She thought, this band's going to be part of my life. Oh, wow. And, and within a year, she was part of X. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I saw X, they pinned me to the wall. Yeah. Something, and then you had screaming uh, tribesmen. Uh, yeah, I saw Berlin. I saw the first tribesmen gig down there when they first came from Brisbane. I saw the first uh, one of the earliest celebrate rifles gigs on a Monday night. Oh wow! So we were we were in these what was these cheap households? Yeah, people could earn a dollar work part time. It was a very different world in nineteen yeah eighty three, and you could wing it and. Um, Beers for 80 cents, the doll was 40 bucks. <laughs> what you could get was a room in a household for $15, dollars $16. Wow, and interesting. You, and people were played in bands or putting bands to get half assed musicians like me who couldn't really play but got better much later on. Yeah. Um, but we had our, our visions, we had our fashion, we had our attitude. And it was a rebellion to the pub rock Western suburbs thing. Yeah. It was much more. And we were looking to the world with these bands like the scientists, the Triffitts, the Gabriel Joins, the Birthday Party, or Lazy yeah. Cells as an international band. Yeah. The Cold Chisels and all those sort of bands were very Australian centric. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very creative, artistic time. And, and then you might end up in the cross at four o'clock. You yeah. might be in Paris Green uh, in the cross, or you might be going to a Gothic nightclub. But it was 24 hour. We were 24 hour people. And Tex Perkins, even um, in his book, I was reading that he said the hotel was a small place, but every local and interstate band wanted to actually um, play there. And it was like seven nights a week. 
Yep. Um, and I think he said that's where he put the Beast of Bourbon together when he met or when he was with, you know, Boris. Um, he was living with Jules Normington in a shed in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, he was a, a larrikin. I mean, he was only about yeah. when he came down and he, and he, you know, he just had attitude and yeah. he was putting all these different types of bands together like Fargo and Sal Salamander Jim and mixing with lots of people and, and that be suburban album that first album with uh, kim and um just one of those great mar like the first x album where yeah six or seven hours and it's just an amazing record but i just saw so many it's like seven nights a week and i'd be seeing the greatest bands in the world i'd be seeing yeah. the Spiders, the Triffids, Lime spiders x celebrate rifles and just so many other bands yeah also there was tribal stuff going on because it was Nights when you'd go down there it was quite violent because, you know, there'd be the mod night and all the mods would be there and the skinners would turn up to try and bash them up. Yeah, so, I did. I did yeah. read about that. And as well, I think I read somewhere that it was also home to a lot of um, Sydney's bikies maybe at one stage. Maybe that, would been, that would have been pre the band scene. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm talking about when I landed there. Yeah. It was just amazing parties associated with it. You know, yep. you think about parties and, you know, I remember going to one party and there was a Johnny Smith laying on the front lawn after a gig completely smashed. Yeah. <laughs> I never ever realised how exciting this life we had was so exciting and we all had to grow up. But we would, you know, talk about Manchester and 24-7 and, but we were we were all living that, and we're all, a lot of people for as I said were interstate, or in the case of something like I mean, No Man's Land were an amazing band, and Dave yeah. Lismore, but yeah. it, was, it became this area of around Surrey or Darlinghurst of these amazing let's say musicians, or was filmmakers, or was writers, and 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 we're all young. Yeah, a lot of creatives. Yeah, yeah, eighteen to twenty-three. You know, that's what the, probably what the age bracket was. There was a few other people might have been in their mid twenties, but yeah, they, we're just vibrant, exciting people taking the world on, and the bands were were very, very free and artistically adventurous as well. I think that's a key um, key word there because even I remember watching um, a video of. Uh, the crystal ballroom and uh, some of the, the punters that went, uh, I remember one lady recalling of, of what an exciting time it was and, you know, she used to just be so excited going to all these gigs that, that were everywhere. You could go to so many places and, and that's well, like Melbourne, Sydney. Melbourne was St Kilda and yeah. uh, all sides was a bit artier. And it, yeah. we had we had Sariel's Darling House and I think a bit was going. Newtown ended up taking over a bit. There's a bit going on in Newtown, but it was it was sorry. I've also read that um, Stuart and Roger brought um, the Trogs. Another gig I went to. Oh, you did! Wow, how exciting! The Garmin would tell us, you know, we'd turn up. Oh, by the way, the Trogs are playing next Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, you know, that was it. Oh, yeah, okay. Greatest gig that was playing there, and it was Stuart Kerb and Roger Grierson, and that was a wild story where they turned up at the airport, and only three, two or three members of the Gun Club actually turned at the LA airport. And they had to get um, uh, Billy and Spencer to join the band. They did from the Johnnies. Johnnies, yeah. yeah. And they pieced it together. They didn't know where they were going. Now Gary Gray told me they were doing the supports, the Sacred Cowboys. Yeah. Whether the gigs were going to go on or not. And the Gun Club were amazing, but the influence of the Gun Club affected a lot of bands. That that cowboy punk, and now that came. It came a whole new genre of music. I think Gun Club Tour had a huge effect on the way they played guitar. It was deep tuned like an old bluesman. Yeah. And and Jeffrey uh, was he was a really interesting guy. It was like, oh, like yeah. between Blondie and Elvis. You yeah, know, yeah. You know, he was a character. He was soul. Uh, he had so much soul on stage, and that bass player Patricia, and then you had. Um, Spencer on guitar. Look, I I regard that as in the top ten gigs of my life. In Gun Club at the Strawberry Hill, you can define rock and roll. Gun Club at Strawberry Hill. Oh, that's fantastic! And I and sometimes yeah. I was pushed in the front, ended up right on the stage in my head in the drum kit. It was so packed, it's so exciting. Um, and it was and a small venue, wasn't it? I would have in that room would have held one hundred and fifty 
packed. Oh, is that all? <laughs> yeah. The Cypress gigs were amazing, Kim. Was yeah. Amazing. I mean, it was just vibrant. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of those Perth bands, you know, the Scientists, the Hoodoo Gurus, the Triffords, yeah, just um, finding their little sort of niche in Surrey Hills. And Can I say the F word? <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> well, what I loved about these bands like the Triffords and they, they'd seen the go between to the birthday party, a lot of these bands went, fuck it. Oh, yeah. We don't – the Scientists had gone out and played suburbia and got absolutely destroyed. So yeah. Just right, yeah. and they went fuck it. I said we're going straight to Europe in England. We don't need this. We don't need that. Yeah, free bullshit. We we're going to sell our guitars. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going yeah. to overseas and try and wing it and have a go and have a go. And that, and they were really it was really amazing time because the bands just ignored the mainstream of the music industry. I'm not disrespecting. Yeah. Ski or Albert, what was going on? The, the people, but these people were outlaws in the music. Industry. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I and I think people that spirit of just getting on a plane, yeah, guitar with five hundred bucks in your pocket with each one in the band is it, it was really exciting and showed a lot of spirit of those young bands and brave. Yeah, very and brave. brave the birthday yeah. party, was the bravest. The go betweens were really brave. Yeah, if it's. And seeing the Triffids with 100 people on a Wednesday night, I was saying this the other day, 100 people at the residency, and within two years, they were front page of New Music Express and Melody Maker. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know, just amazing. When I do my research, I love reading about all these bands that are, you know, quite well known now and have, have become fantastic at their craft. And, and they did start in some of these really small uh, pubs in, in Sydney, you know, and they kind of got their apprenticeship in a sense not just sydney i guess M melbourne too and There's still great young bands around now oh I, yeah absolutely I see these exciting exciting young bands but they they are got the same attitude they say well this is it and yeah i see bands have and they've already done free tours of europe and america yeah to 150 people in sydney you know yeah and i love their attitude you know there's been a lot of talk about the reasons behind a lot of the venues closing in sydney and melbourne and you know from 300 you know we've only got a, a handful i guess now uh yeah. some of the venues did close and some kind of changed um where for example even the strawberry um now is is very different to what it used to be oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah i just wanted your thoughts on you know why do you think so many venues closed down um, over the last 10, even 20 years? Okay. It goes back to the 80s. The first change was liquor licensing laws. Yeah. By regulations. Yeah. And with respect, I had to change because we saw Absolutely. a <laughs> fire in Canada. Yeah. A thousand people were killed. These were fire traps and with one entrance or whatever, and I had stage door cabin tavern, all those sort of venues. I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah. I think about 40% of the venues went because they couldn't afford to do what needed to be done. Yeah, I agree. And stuff like that. But we never had that terrible incident in Australia, which is good. Yeah. Although we had Luna Park, and I, I do believe that that could have impacted, um, you know, legislation. and. Very good you know, insight. I'd never thought about it. Yeah, Luna Park. I, I read that somewhere. But, um, yeah, and look, you know, having said that, it is nice to know that you can still, and, and as you do, you, you do go out and attend live gigs, as do I, um, but I guess you live in Sydney and, and I'm more coastal. But there are there are quite a few venues that are still so, hosting so, bands. Such exciting young bands around. Yeah. Kids weren't going to pubs anymore. Yeah. The big event, like the big day out or home bake or – it's yeah, just, the festivals kind of, yeah, started becoming really popular, didn't they? And that was the success of Big Day Out. So the way people saw bands was different. They'd prepare yeah. $150 and, and see 20 bands in one day instead of yeah. going to the band. I think the biggest change would have to been poker machines. The what, sorry? Poker machines. Oh, poker machines. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Every, I go into these rooms, whether it's the Epping Hotel or – Strawberry Hill, or whatever. Mm. The evening star, where once was the band, where the bands played, is now poker machines. Yeah. And there's yeah. these chronic gamblers there 
on a Thursday night they get their pay and they, they by two o'clock they got nothing. You know, it was just easier for for them to make money in a I guess quickly as well. They could make it quickly. Absolutely. And, yeah. and the fourth thing that's a reason this is internationally. Yeah. When I talk about all oh, the woes of Sydney, I can also talk about what happened in London, inner city of Paris, what yeah. happened in Manhattan. Property prices. Yeah. Because the it's amount of going to sell a lot of beer. Yeah. Keep per square feet of a venue. Yeah. Going. So yeah. It, it's not economical. It's yeah. Not economical to have it, to tore it down and put a block of flats or yeah. paying a thousand dollars for a, a bed sit. Yeah, uh, that's uh, per square feet. And I think if we put it in perspective now, I'm you know if I sort of think about it, I, I'm still quite happy that I can go to Sydney or um, you know Newcastle even up here, um, and, and know that there 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 is still you know a, a few scattered around the city. So it's Absolutely. it's not completely doomed, and there are quite a lot of young kids that. Um, uh, uh, you know, picking up guitars and, and forming bands, and I think there's and, more kids than anything. And I think, yeah, and I love their work ethic. They treat their band like a cottage industry. Yeah, like they have their streams of income. Where, but I think it was more let's let's play and get drunk, and it was more. And now they they take it a lot more seriously. Yeah, they merch. They got their Spotify. They got their band camp. They do a limited edition of their vinyl. They might sign it. Yeah. I know they're not going to play. They can't play twice a week. They might play. They might come down and put a single out and do four shows around the country. Yeah. But the hell out of it. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. Um, but these band and all they do so much work on Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. These bands work so hard. Yeah. And, I and they're very savvy. They're very computer savvy and, and savvy with how the whole kind of exposure can take them places, you know. Exactly. That's why they, they might be getting 150 people in Sydney, but they might be have a huge following in New York and get 300. Uh, Grace Cummings is mind-blowing. Yeah, I've heard Grace. Yeah, she's and amazing. Absolutely. Her voice and she's yeah. got a full you know, New Music Express, Village Voice, Mojo, yep. won five-star reviews, and she blew them away when she went overseas. Yeah. And I thought the full Flower Moon Band, I saw them a week ago, and I mm -hmm. went, oh, my goodness. You're one of the most brilliant, exciting bands I've seen. In. Oh, just, wow. Excellent. Just, they just give it everything on stage, and they're making really interesting, dark. I, I got the weirdest uh, description of them. They're, they're like um, uh, Jefferson Airplane 1967 crossed with the birthday party. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, if you could that's, think that's that, a band I'll have to go and check out. Yeah. Yeah, if you could <laughs> think of that comedy, 67 Psych Rock, um, and she's got the whole thing, and, but they've got a much more ferocious birthday party edge. Oh, wow. Also, Edwin, I wanted to ask you, um, I know you've performed with um, your former band Waxworks um, at the Evening Star Hotel in Sydney. Um, did they call it the Evil Star? Is that true? Yeah, a promoter came in and called it that. <laughs> it a bit of a vibe. Look, when the Strawberry Hill closed, you had the trade unions still going. It sort of splintered it because the Hope Town started happening a lot more. Yeah. And I don't think the Hope Town wanted the darker, more edgy events. Yeah. With respect to the Hope Town. And I love the Hope Town. It's my favourite venue. Absolutely, yeah. Waxworks got in because we were a darker pop band. We were the most commercial type of band they'd have playing there. Lubricated Goat and all those sort of black eye bands. And yeah. Tex would be playing down there. And it'd go to 3 o'clock in the morning. Like, the band, like when you played there, the last band would go on at 1 o'clock in the morning. Oh, okay. And it was very, I, I saw a gothic mix with punks. And the first band that played there, it was one of the most underrated bands in Sydney, I feel, was New, No Man's Land. No Man's Land. And Hard On used to play there early on. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. If you're going to have listened to some of No Man's Land stuff, what the most famous thing about the Evening Star is David Bowie. I did, yeah, I did read that, that he used to have drinks there with his sound guy when he was recording the yeah, Teeth album. Yeah. 
So he, he it was only down the road from EMI, and, and he was he made his things. He wouldn't go to the Mansell room, not Bowie. Yeah, that's not that's for Guns and Roses. Sorry, yeah. Bowie wanted so he wanted to hear where the edge of music was. Yeah. And I respect Bowie for this. And he went he at least once, maybe twice, went down to the Evening Star, would sit there, watch the bands. The bands could not believe Bowie. Wow. I know. And I know one night he played, it was Box of Jesuit, Distant Losis, and the Black Box. They were great. Yeah. And they were just couldn't believe. But Bowie was really sweet. And people, a couple of people ran back to their homes in Surrey Hills and got but Bowie albums and got a bit <laughs> to sign him. Yeah. yeah, but he was really low key, and he talked to the bands about how much he liked their music. And oh, stuff. that's great! And yeah. he loves Sydney. Yeah, oh, we had a flat loser with Bowie. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I've got to get kudos to Bowie. That's, doing, that's awesome. Definitely going to a really underground venue at and the Evening was, Star. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd been there earlier in the night. And I missed him. Oh wow! What a shame. But and everyone told me to ring and and uh yeah and I I know people who he actually kept contact with from now oh on. wow so yeah that's amazing absolutely true. absolutely true yeah that's amazing I don't know whether it's Kim Salmon or Box of Fish are the first people in, who used the term grunge oh right oh I've got a seen a poster where Box of Fish in eighty one eighty two grunge night yep. And Kim Salmon described his music as grunge music. This oh, is wow. This is years prior. Before, yeah. Now, what happened was with these sort of bands, there used to be tapes, compilation tapes. Yeah. Around the world. And um, these tapes were heard by people like Mud Honey who would buy them. Yeah. And they'd seen the term grunge. So there is a, an academic essay that links it all, but... Kim and definitely Box of Fish referenced it, defined and created that term. Oh, isn't that grunge, interesting? At least six years prior. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. Actually, and, I forgot to mention, Edwin, the Battle of the Bands at, um, yeah, at the Strawberry Hills Hotel. I went that religiously, yeah. Yeah, that was quite popular, wasn't it? I think it was Sunday. And I, we, as I said, we go down. Some of the bands were good, some bands were Yeah. Happy mind blowing and that was that was the gigs that launched the lime spiders oh okay yep they i love them. the lime spiders i, I well, think they're a great band well that was the band that they signed the green records and that was part of the prize and that would have been stuart and roger yeah it's an amazing double seven inch which i, I remember buying yeah it's it classic as the lime spiders were six garage rock played with marshall stacks yeah yeah and they were a great band, and, and uh, he had an, he has an amazing vocal. Yeah, yeah. No, one, one of my favourite bands, actually. Them, you know, um, the Hoodoo Gurus are one of my all time favourites. I I just remember when Stone Age Romeos came out, actually, and that was it. I was hooked. <laughs> Even Painters and Dockers, I think they played there. Actually, I did want to mention. Um, I've seen some photos of uh, the Eurythmics when they were called the Tourists. Yes. And they played there. Is that true? Look, I I never I don't know that. that yeah, I don't know that could be true. I think Tony but, Mott was the photographer, and I'm sure yeah. I read somewhere that it was at that at that place. It, it might have been when it was called the Southern Cross. I'm not sure. But I did see the Divine Stewart show there. Oh wow! Awesome. And, it was packed and Chrissy was yeah. light because um, Chrissy was wild. And, yeah. Uh, and the venue was packed for the divine, so it was meant to be a secret gig. But within days, it spread in every household in Surrey Hills. Oh wow! Like that was what it's like. Yeah. Oh, the divine are playing Strawberry Hill. Yeah. Week, you know, the Gun Club are playing. You know, so yeah. Well, thank you for t uh, chatting to me, Edwin. It's been fantastic hearing you know all about just Sydney and and these little oh. pubs that. Um, yeah, we were teenagers or early 20s. Yeah. <laughs> part time, part time jobs. Um, but I just don't think we realised at the time this is, this is a. Re I want to leave it with one comment with Damien. Yeah. Damien said, what we had in Surrey Hills between 80 and 83 was as good as anywhere in the world, as good as what was happening with CBGBs and that scene in the middle. Yeah. Is what was happening in London. We had this window of opportunity for a couple of years in Sydney in the early 80s 
which was one of the most exciting music scenes in the world. And I'm not saying it wasn't happening in Melbourne, and it has happened in Melbourne. Yeah. But that was a special moment. I, uh, I believe that. I believe that. And I think um, I think it's true that, you know, if you sort of even, you know, compared what was happening during that period to certain other places around the world, we had it so good. We did. We, we were, you know, exposed to so much talent and so many, so many, you know, so many people who wanted to get out there and, uh, and play. Yeah. I mean, you had the inner city thing, great. Yeah. But you also had the, the beer barns. The beer barns, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I've been thinking, and the oils are an amazing man. And, yeah. And, and Don Walker's an amazing song, Chisel. Oil. Yeah. And those sort of guys were out there. It was exciting that I, and I worked out that on a Friday night, there's 16 venues on the Northern Beaches. There was 15,000 kids on a Friday night seeing original bands. Wow. And one spot, one area of Sydney. There's probably 4,000 in the inner city. There's probably another 5,000 in the western suburbs and another 5,000 in the Shire. How fantastic. It's an exciting time. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely was. It really was. Well, thank you so much, Edwin. And, um, yeah, it's been really nice chatting. Thank you for talking. You have a good day. Thank you. Bye.